Oh, this is getting embarrassing. The highest profile case in the county for decades. And we got nothing to go on. The trouble is, it's a motiveless crime. No sign of sexual assault. No sign of robbery. Just two 15-year-old lads out for a walk in the countryside who end up being brutally murdered. There's not one shred of useful evidence. No DNA match to anyone on the database. No witnesses. No CCTV. No weapon. No nothing. But I say there's no weapon. But from the wounds, we think it was something like a machete. A machete? I mean, Christ, this is rural England, not bongo bongo land. Well, to make matters worse, I grew up a couple of miles from Fullerton, where it happened. People know me round there. I'm getting out of a lot of stick from the locals. And there was me thinking these murders would be my passport to promotion. And nope, still plain old Diaz Dunderdale. And now, with the anniversary of the murders coming up, I'm getting a shitload of pressure from on high. I've been told, in no uncertain terms, I don't come up with something, I'll see myself back in uniform and directing traffic before you can say Tommy Robinson. Well, I'll say there were no witnesses, but three locals saw this black bloke hanging around Fullerton War Memorial in the days leading up to the murders. The problem was their descriptions didn't exactly tally, but we still managed to come up with a focal fit. Inspector Alvis says it just looks like a generic black man. Well, he used a different word to black man, if you get my drift. <laughs> but, but that's the one thing the descriptions had in common. You see, the thing is, we don't get many blacks round here. So when you do see one, that's the first thing you notice. Don't usually notice anything else, apart from the fact that they generally look very suspicious. But the one thing they all agreed on was that he was very black. To get an idea as to his precise hue, Mrs. Willen referred to the Ace of Spades, which wasn't a lot of help. Anyway, at my instigation, the photo fit artist has had another session with all three witnesses, to see if we can come up with something better. And I've circulated the new image to all the newspapers. So, we'll see what happens. Well, there's been a massive response to the photo fit. Just like there was the first time around. Over 2,000 people thought they recognised the suspect. Well, that took some sifting, of course. It turns out several of them identified David Lammy, the Shadow Secretary of State for Justice. But uh, fortunately for him, he was given a speech to the Labour Party conference in Blackpool at the time of the murders. Anyway, one elderly lady in Woodhaven thought it looked like our next-door neighbour, Yusuf Masood. And lo and behold, she told us he has some previous, with a machete. So, at last, we're getting somewhere. It turns out Masood got 18 months for attacking his girlfriend's husband about five years ago. Apparently there were extenuating circumstances, which is why his sentence was a bit on the short side, but... A black man who matches the photo fit and carries around a machete? Well, it's more than suggestive. So, we all him in. And of course, he denies having anything to do with the murders, but there was something about his manner that told me he was lying through his teeth. It's a, a bit difficult to explain, but in my job, you, you just get a hunch about people. Once you get them in an interview room, you can tell if they're guilty within the first 30 seconds. Sometimes even before they've opened their mouths. He was an insolent bastard as well. Chewed gum throughout the first interview. 
which was also very suggestive because chewing gum had been found near the scene of the crime. When we asked him if he'd ever been to Fullerton, he claimed he hadn't, but uh, after a little probing, it turns out that a few years ago, he had a holiday at the caravan park at Thornley Point, and you have to drive through Fullerton to get there. So he knew the area, and what's more important, he lied about it, which tells you a lot. Now, I also interviewed the woman who fingered him, his next-door neighbour, Mrs Hall. I asked her if she'd noticed anything odd about his behaviour around the time of the murders. I uh, implied there'd be a reward in it for her if she could help us out. Uh, mind you, this was all unofficial. We are not supposed to do that, so it had to come out of petty cash. <laughs> I also reminded her how the papers tend to be very generous for any tidbits from anyone involved in the case. Eventually, she said, now I came to mention it, she seemed to remember seeing bloodstains on his clothes on at least one occasion about a year ago. So, all things considered, I'm certain we've got our man. He's a good match for the photo fit. You've got his previous with the machete. You've got the chewing gum. You've got the fact that he knew the area. You've got the lie about never having been to the village. You've got the blood on his clothes. And to top it all, he didn't have an alibi for the day of the murders. He said he couldn't remember what he was doing on a Tuesday evening 14 months ago. He claimed he was probably out for a jog. <laughs> a likely story. For which, of course, he has absolutely no corroboration. He said he usually goes jogging alone. How very convenient. He said he usually takes a shower after a jog and he tends to do that alone as well. Uh, he's a cocky bastard. Now we've got our man all right. It's just a matter of proving it. First off, we had an ID parade. All black men, of course. Well, fair's fair. And we wheeled in the three local witnesses. Now, Mrs. Willen's eyesight isn't what it was, so she wasn't much help. Mr. Proctor thought they all looked guilty of sin and wanted to have a second go, but even then he couldn't say for sure. He said the murderer could just as easily have been any one of them, and perhaps they were all in on it together. I think he's missing the point. Mrs Bainbridge took her time about it, but eventually she identified Masood, which pleased me no end. <laughs> she said she was certain on account of him being a good deal blacker than the others. Now, with Masood having previous, his DNA was already on the system, and unfortunately, there wasn't a match. Otherwise, we'd have caught him on day one. But just in case, we uh, tested everything again, both his DNA and the DNA on the gum and some other stuff from the uh, scene of the crime. While we were waiting for the result, I wanted to keep him locked up. Trouble was, Aldous didn't think we had enough evidence to hold him for much longer. So, I goes back to Woodhaven to organise a thorough search of his house. And um, guess what we found in his bathroom cupboard? Eight grams of cocaine. Well, that was a turn up for the books. Of course, Masood claims he's never seen it before and he accuses me of planting it. Well, he would, wouldn't he? So now, we can hold him on drugs charges. Well, let's face it, he can get up to seven years for possession. So, yesterday morning, 
Masood goes into Strange Marsh on remand while we put together our case against him. While he's there, the DNA comes back and there's still no match, which was very disappointing. So, frankly, the evidence is looking a bit flimsy, to say the least. So, we could be back to square one. He's guilty. There's no question about it. We've got our man. But the evidence just won't stand up in court. It's all circumstantial. We need more. Aldis said, uh, go out and find it. I have an idea. Now, what with his previous, Masood knows the ropes. He knows full well how, in the nick, if you've, been, you've committed a crime against children, you're the lowest of the low. They brand you a nonce, and you're fair game for all kinds of violence from the other inmates, and even the screws. Or at the very least, the screws tend to turn a blind eye. <laughs> and more particularly, you're also fair game for the other inmates saying how you confess to the crime. And these cell confessions carry a great deal of weight. I've always found that a bit surprising. I mean, if I, as a policeman, or any other authority figure for that matter, were to get a confession out of Masood and it wasn't properly recorded, or maybe I forget to give him a caution, well, then that simply wouldn't be admissible in court. But, if a lying, cheating criminal who's never uttered an honest word in his life says he heard Masood confess to the murders in the privacy of their cell, well, that can be enough to convict him. Of course, Masood knows all about this, so he asks to be put in solitary. That way, he won't get to speak to any other prisoner, so no one can claim that he's confessed to the murders. So, uh, my little idea runs into a bit of a problem. Still, I think I can see a way around it. There is an old lag in D-Wing, Ted Pike, who's serving 15 years for armed robbery and GBH. He's uh, helped us out on a few occasions, all off the record, of course, otherwise he wouldn't be much use to me. Now, Pike's from Carlisle. And he wants to be moved to HMP Sladewell to be nearer to his family. And if I have a word in the right ear, I should be able to swing it. So, I drove up to Strange Marsh and had a quiet word with Pike. I told him Alma Sood definitely murdered those lads. And there was no question about it. And Al, a statement from him just might make it a bit easier to secure a conviction, along with all the other evidence against him. You see, I didn't want Pike to think that anything he might come up with would end up being the, the main evidence against Masood. He was a bit reluctant at first, but uh, when I mentioned how Masood's a devout Muslim, Pike eventually agreed to help out. <laughs> he obviously doesn't have much time for Muslims. <laughs> well, who does, what with all that's been going on? So, according to my instructions, the following day, he creates a commotion in the kitchen in D-Wing. Basically, he complained about the porridge being too lumpy. And ended up pouring a panful over the cook. 
piping hot as well. The poor guy got th third degree burns for his trouble. <laughs> so, Pike ends up in solitary, along with Masood. Now, they're in separate cells, of course. But every day, they get half an hour in the exercise yard under the strict supervision of one of the screws. So normally, they can't get to talk. But uh, I made sure that this screw left them alone for five minutes. And next thing I hear, Pike wants me to come back to Strange Marsh for a nice little chat. Pikes prepared to testify in court to the effect that Masoud told him how he'd done the machete killings. I get Pike to uh, sign a statement, which I'd prepared earlier. Well, you've got to bend the rules a little, haven't you? It's a hell of a lot better than letting a killer walk free. Anyway, Pike's no fool. And he wanted to know about Masoud's motive and thought maybe if he had confessed... He would have explained why he'd done it as well. But of course, only Masood knows the answer to that. So, I report back to Aldis, who thinks we might have the beginnings of a case, although he's concerned about how there's nothing in the statement that wasn't already in the public domain. He thinks any defence barrister worth his salt could demolish Pike's account in five minutes. They could say how he might have seen that documentary about the case and how there's nothing in Masood's confession who hadn't already been discussed on TV or, or in the papers as well, for that matter. So, I uh, need to make a few tweaks to Pike's statement. The only thing that wasn't in the public domain is a rather nasty detail about the murders. We kept that back just to spare the families as much as anything. After slaying the boys, the assailant left them face down in the grass. He then wiped his weapon on the boys' backs, creating these bloody stains. Three lines arranged roughly in the shape of an upside-down letter A on one of them, more like a number four on the other, like a kind of motif. We were going to call them the A4 murders before we decided to keep the information to ourselves. None of us could work out what A4 could possibly mean anyway. The A4 doesn't go anywhere near here. We could hardly refer to the paper size, could it? We couldn't make any tale of it. So, I drive up to Strange Marsh again, so Pike could sign Statement Mark 2, which includes a mention of these bloody marks. Pike wanted to know what the marks meant. He thought maybe if Masood had mentioned them, he'd have explained their meaning as well. He has a point there. We didn't really have an answer to that. So, I decided to interview Masood yet again. Apart from accusing me of fitting him up, he wouldn't talk. So, I showed him the photos with the bloody marks, and I asked him, what was that all about? Then he starts talking. He asked me what I know about the victims. Well, not much, to be honest. We'd been working on the assumption that there wasn't any connection between the victims and their killer. We thought it was probably just some random frenzied attack. They just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. They didn't have any money on them. There was no sign of sexual assault. Just two friends walking through the countryside. Masood wondered if they were more than just friends. Of course, I could see what he was getting at, but there was no evidence of... That being a factor, he called me an ignorant fuckwit, which won't do him any favours at all. Then, 
He mentioned how the Nazis used to force queers to wear these pinkish-red triangle symbols. None of us had seen the lines as forming triangles. When I showed in the photos, I saw them upside down for the first time, and for that angle, I suppose you could say the patterns were very roughly triangular. If you, you really stretch your imagination. Masood said it could have been a homophobic attack. I asked him, is that what he was admitting to? He said he was admitting nothing. He was just pointing out my ignorance. <laughs> Bloody cheek of the man. Well, this certainly puts a different complexion on things. I spoke to both victims' parents, and they were very put out when I asked if their sons were queer. But then we had a look at some of their smartphone messages, and when you read between the lines and view them in the light of this new lead, it seems distinctly possible that something dodgy might well have been going on. The parents certainly weren't at all happy to hear about that. One of the dads asked me to get out of his house, saying I shouldn't speak ill of the dead. Round these parts, most people have no more time for queers than blacks. When it comes out that a black murdered a couple of queers, they won't know what to think. They'll be torn between wanting to string him up and pat him on the back. Most people in Fullerton have lived in this neck of the woods all their lives. They believe in family values, tradition, patriotism and what have you. They're conservative, if you like, with a small C, and with a big C as well, more often than not. They're not cosmopolitan, metropolitan, bleeding heart liberals. Put it this way. They're very happy with the way things have been going in the country just lately, and they're looking forwards to seeing a few less foreigners on the streets. And let's face it, whatever people say, for most of us, that's what it's all been about. So, with one thing and another, it's no wonder those lads didn't come out to their parents. We asked around the village, and it turns out, on one occasion... The crossing lady at their school noticed them walking hand in hand. But they soon stopped when she caught sight of them. So, what if Masood came across them holding hands? It's enough to make anyone's stomach churn. If anything, it makes me even more certain he did it. He's Muslim, and we all know what they think about queers. It's a criminal offence in most Muslim countries. A, a capital offence in some... They string them up in Iran. I just wonder why Masood brought it up. Maybe he wanted people to know the boys were killed for being queer, but without actually admitting it, he'd done it himself. Yeah, that sort of makes sense. Kind of puts the blame on the victims. There's absolutely no doubt in my mind. He's as guilty as sin. But we've still got nothing linking him to the scene of the crime. And what now seems to be the motive can't be attributed directly to Masood, despite him being a Muslim. Aldis still thinks we need more evidence. So, I'm going down to Woodhaven to have a nosy around. I found out a bit more about this previous machete attack. It looks like Masood was carrying on with this married woman and her husband, Jacob, arrives on his doorstep carrying a machete. He's black as well. It's the rule of the jungle with them. 
He's intent on punishing Masood for going off with his woman. They get into a scuffle. Masood wrestles the machete off Jacob and lays into him. Jacob ends up in hospital and Masood gets 18 months for GBH. With time off for good behaviour, he's out in nine months. And Jacob still walks with a limp. I wasn't getting much from Masood's friends and family. They've closed ranks and they're all standing up for him. No one will admit that he hates queers, for example, which is a pity. It seems like Masood's closer to his sister Faiza than anyone else. Well, she's certainly been most vocal in declaring his innocence, but she even appeared on the one show implying he was being fitted up, the fucking cheek. I asked Aldis if we could sue her for defamation. <laughs> he suggested a better tactic might be to have a, a word with Tom Gates. Now, Gates is a sort of unofficial undercover operative. He's worked for the police for ooh, getting on 15 years now usually taking on false identities and inveigling his way into the company of a suspect's family and friends. He looks for new angles and new evidence, especially when we don't have a strong enough case. And even when there isn't any evidence, he uh, usually manages to find some, if you get my drift. <laughs> or he also gets involved in these miscarriage of justice campaign groups or maybe groups who are trying to hold the police to account. Like when the, the Mead Valley Force didn't seem to be pulling their finger out over the murder of that black girl in Dartwich. He basically tries to find ways to undermine anyone who tries to rubbish the police. Now, as far as I can tell, Faiza is single. And Gates is the sort of man women are drawn to. He has that uh, aura of mystery which comes from living his life in the shadows. And it helps with him being a half-caste, because, <laughs> let's face it, they tend to stick to their own kind. So, we set Gates up with a new identity from a kid who died in the 80s. And off he goes to Woodhaven to join this campaign group protesting Masood's innocence. It wasn't long before Gates, or Ashim, as he's calling himself now, makes Faiza's acquaintance, and in his last report, he mentioned a dinner at her place. Just the two of them. All very cosy. Well, Gates has certainly come up with the goods. <laughs> it turns out there's another sibling, Bilal, who Masood hasn't spoken to in years. It seems that uh, Faiza didn't really want to talk about it, but uh, putting two and two together, it looks like Bilal's a queer, and that's why Masood doesn't want to have anything to do with him. So, to cut a long story short, the CPS agreed there was more than enough evidence, and we've got a date for the trial. Now, we're pretty sure Masood will go down for the killings. Apart from anything else, the uh, press coverage has been pretty damning. Uh, the mail was fairly typical, with his ugly mug on the front page with the headline, Face of Evil. <laughs> I'm hoping some of the jury got to see that. <laughs> Interestingly... Masood's elected not to give evidence on his own behalf. Well, I'm guessing his defence team thinks it won't do him any favours. He's obviously not thick, but he's not particularly articulate. And he has this aggressive and arrogant manner, which would give a very negative impression to the jury. Still, the fact that he's chosen not to defend himself... Won't look good from the jury's perspective. 
And I'm sure they'll form their own opinions when they see him sat in the dark with his fierce brooding features and his threatening posture. <laughs> Puts me in mind of a wound up spring. <laughs> Put it this way, he's not the sort you'd want to meet in a dark alley. <clears throat> Well, things aren't going quite as smoothly as we'd hoped. For a start, Masood's defence barrister tried to discredit the ID parade. It didn't help when Mrs Bainbridge admitted that they all looked the same to her. Then they pointed out that Masood would hardly have drawn attention to the likely homophobic nature of the killings if he himself was known to eight queers. Unfortunately, Gates' information proved to be useless because although Brother Brillal is definitely a queer, this wasn't the reason they'd fallen out. It would turn out to be something Bilal had said uh, about Masood being the architect of his own misfortune for carrying on with the wife of a local hard man. <sighs> God, and to make matters worse... Mrs. Hall wasn't at all impressive in the witness stand. She was all very vague about the bloodstained clothes, and when it came out that she'd been paid 15 grand by the Express for her story, the judge asked the jury to disregard her testimony. Well, the defence made a lot about the, the lack of any of Masood's DNA at the crime scene, and, and they made out that it was hardly conceivable that the assailant wouldn't have left some kind of trace. There was plenty of DNA found, almost certainly belonging to the assailant, but none of it was Masood's. The, the prosecution tried to make the case that the chewing gum found at the scene matched the brand Masood habitually used, but the fact that this didn't have any of his DNA tended to support the defence case in the end. So uh, that was a bit of an own goal. The pros prosecution presented the evidence that he'd lied about having been in the village. But the defence rubbished that when they showed how you can drive right through Fullerton and not even know it, because it wasn't well signposted. That was a bummer. So, um, now, it all boils down to Pike's evidence of the confession. I thought Pike gave a good account of himself. He came over as dignified and very plausible. The final version of the confession included Masood's homophobic rantings and how he made the bloody triangles, and the fact that there was no mention of them in the public domain was very persuasive. As the prosecution pointed out, there was no way Pike could have known about this if he hadn't heard it from Masood. Despite what Faizer had been saying in public, Masood's defence barrister clearly wasn't prepared to imply that the police could have provided the information. They obviously decided it wouldn't be a good idea to impugn police integrity, which was handy for me. The defence pointed out that outside the confession, there was no corroborating proof that Masood was homophobic, but the prosecution argued that it was a common enough attitude for people of his background. <coughs> Although the judge's summing up was pretty fair, 
He made the point that the case rested entirely on Pike's evidence. He said the jury had to consider whether the word of a known felon was a sufficiently reliable basis to find Massoud guilty beyond reasonable doubt. But, he added, there was no particular reason to doubt the veracity of Pike's account. The jury adjourned for four days. And when they came back, they still hadn't been able to reach a unanimous verdict. The judge said the court would accept a majority verdict, and they were back again in half an hour with a 10 to 2 majority in favour of a guilty verdict. It was obvious which two had thought he was innocent because they were both in tears. Well, they didn't have any cause to shed tears for that brute. So, we got him. <laughs> Masood's serving two life sentences. The only way he'll ever see freedom at some point in the very distant future is to admit to his crimes and recant. But no, he continues to maintain his innocence. <laughs> Frankly, as long as he does that, he'll never get out. Which is all right by me.